2013 was not the best of years for integrity in sporting. Some of the nation's largest sports and stars were hit by scandals involving performance-enhancing drugs. First in January, Lance Armstrong admitted to using performance-enhancing drugs in his comeback from cancer to win all of his Tour de France titles. Then in February, linebacker Ray Lewis, thought to be one of the most dominant players in the defensive history of the NFL, recovered with uh, surprising speed from an injury to return to his final Super Bowl. His recovery was aided in large part by deal antler spray, which mimics human growth hormone, a substance which is banned in most sports. Then in the summer, baseball was struck again. Alex Rodriguez and about 20 other stars were found to be using performance enhancing drugs. This ended in year long and for Alex Rodriguez, a two year ban. What though if the problems that are seen with performance enhancing drugs aren't just for multi-million dollar athletes playing on a big stage? What if performance enhancing drugs hit closer to home? What if they were occurring in, the in a classroom near you? Well, recent scientific studies indicate that might just be the case. The Journal for the American Association of Childhood and Adolescent Psychiatrists looked at recent literature that's been published on drug use in teenagers. What they found was that enhancing drugs were being used in the classroom by students at the high school and the college level. At the high school level, about 7% of students have admitted to using some sort of drug to enhance their studying skills, where at the collegiate level, 20%, one-fifth, have admitted to similar usage. Why is this occurring in such an epidemic measures, and what do students think they're going to gain from taking performance-enhancing drugs? Let's take a look at the science behind the drugs that students are using in the classroom. These two drugs are primarily Ritalin and Adderall. What these drugs do is act on the neurological system. You can see the picture which depicts the junction between two nerves in the brain. The nerves are joined at what is called a synapse. At that point, there's a small gap between the nerve that's sending the signal and the nerve that is receiving the signal. The signal is passed between the two by release of chemicals. What Ritalin and Adderall do is act at the interface between these two to stimulate the response of the nerves. They do this by releasing two different molecules, dopamine and neuroepinephrine. Dopamine is involved in motivation, cognition, pleasure, and movement of the human body, whereas neuroepinephrine is part of the flight or fight response that produces energy for the body to use. What uses can be made of such a response in the nervous system caused by these two drugs? Well, first, doctors prescribe these drugs to be used in two conditions primarily. The first is narcolepsy, where the patient is constantly following into sleep-like symptoms. The drugs stimulate the nervous system and allow the patient to stay awake, alert, and attentive. The second is attention deficit disorder, hyper hyperactivity disorder. Now, this might seem a little strange that you would give a stimulant to someone who is already hyperactive and attention deficit, but the result actually works out so that it stimulates the right area of the brain to help the student focus and receive pleasure and gratification in the work that they're doing. However, the use of these drugs don't seem to be limited just to prescribed therapy. Research shows that the amount of sales of these drugs doesn't meet with what's being prescribed by the doctors. Instead, there's a lot to be accounted for. Where are these drugs going? Well, they're being used as unprescribed enhancements. The theory is that if these drugs can help someone who has a deficit of attention, they could also help someone who has a normal attention span be able to enhance that. Though you cannot get something like this from a doctor, you could be able to get these drugs through from friends who have a prescription through the black market or by going to the doctor and faking to receive a false diagnosis of ADHD. This seems like such a good idea. Why would you not want to take a pill that would make you more focused and more able to study and excel in your work? Well, there's a few considerations that we should look at. Let's look first at the legality, then the biology, 
the justice and the philosophy of using these drugs in an unprescribed way to enhance educational ability. Well, the easy answer to the question comes from the United States government, because according to the United States Controlled Substances Act, stimulants, such as Adderall, are a class two controlled substance. This means that either possessing or distributing these drugs in, without a prescription can cause a significant penalty. If you have a possession of the drug, you could be, for the first offense, you could be taken for up to a one year of prison time and fined $1,000. If, on the other hand, you're distributing the drug, even if you're just giving it away and not selling it, there could be up to a 20 year prison sentence and a million dollar fine. Seems like the government takes this pretty seriously. But you might ask, what is such a big deal if this drug is allowed to be used for people who have um, conditions and some students think it enhances their ability? What's the problem? Why would the United States government be so intent in keeping us from having it? The legal questions might seem to become even more confusing when we think about caffeine, a stimulating drug that's ubiquitous. Students can get it in coffee and sodas and energy drinks. No one would expect someone to be able to graduate from college without it. Well, let's take a look and see, and compare and contrast caffeine with pharmaceutical stimulants to see if we can understand why the United States government would see them differently. Let's go back and look at that neural synapse. Caffeine acts at the synapse by binding to the receptors. Those are on the receiving neuron. Basically what it's doing is it's making the, or the nerve think that there's a signal when there's not. What does this do? Well, it stimulates the nerve to, or the body, to produce epinephrine. Epinephrine speeds up the body's metabolism. This gives lots of energy. That's what keeps you awake and gives you the caffeine buzz, with which we're all probably familiar. Pharmaceuticals act in a very different way, though upon the same synapse. Instead of binding to the receptors, they bind to reuptake transporters. Reuptake transporters are found on the surface of the sending neuron. They're responsible for gathering the chemical signal back in so that it first turns off the signal and two, gives the cell the, the signaling molecules that it needs to send uh, to, to stimulate the receiving cell in the future. What happens when you bind to these reuptake transporters? Well, the signal can't be turned off for one thing, and second, the body has to keep producing more and more of its stimulating hormones. The stimulating hormones that are produced are dopamine and neuro neuroepinephrine. Neuroepinephrine is also involved in the fight or flight syndrome, but dopamine acts in a completely different way. It acts on the chemistry of the brain. It's involved in reward centers, studies have found. Basically, it makes your brain feel satisfied and happy with what it's doing. It's what provides the focus that you see. So there's a whole difference in how these act and in their potency. In fact, some have said that the difference between a caffeine and a pharmaceutical stimulant is equivalent to the difference between Tylenol and morphine. What is at risk is not only the level of stimulation, but your body can get burnt out since it has to continue to produce more signaling molecules without being able to recycle the 